And you've got to pay attention to what is discussed in intellectual circles, because when, yeah. when certain ideas take hold among the elites, then that's how they really gain traction over people's lives. Today, we have Rod Dreyer. First, Rod, did I pronounce your name right? Uh, it's close enough. Close enough? How, how do you say it? Yeah, it's, Dreyer is actually how it's pronounced in, in German, okay. but uh, here in South Louisiana, uh, we say Dreyer. Dreyer. Okay. Dr uh, Rod is a senior editor at the American Conservative and the author of this new book, Live Not by Lies, a Manual for Christian Dissidents. We're going to be talking about this book today. Um, it just came out, I believe, was it last month, Rod? September 29th. September 29th. Oh, so, yep, a bit longer than that. Maybe just to start out, could you give us uh, just a overview of what the book is and what inspired you to write it? Sure. Well, five years ago, uh, I got a phone call from a doctor in Minnesota. Uh, he was uh, at the Mayo Clinic. He was the, uh, a friend of mine, was his patient. And the man was really agitated and, and anxious. He said, look, I have to tell somebody this and it's going to be you. He said that his elderly mother lives with him and his wife, and that she is an immigrant from Czechoslovakia. And she spent four years in prison in the 1950s in Czechoslovakia for practicing her Catholic faith. And uh, he told me that mother told him that son, the things I'm seeing happen in America now remind me of what it was like when communism first came to my country. And uh, that just struck me as so weird and alarmist. But uh, so I made a point, though, I, when I would travel around the U.S. Uh, to conferences or to give speeches, if I would run into somebody who grew up either in the Soviet Union or in Soviet dominated Eastern Europe, I would put the same question to them. Are you seeing things in America today that remind you of communism? Every single one of them said yes. And if you talk to them long enough, they would be emphatic about how angry they were that Americans wouldn't take them seriously. Mm. And the main thing they were talking about was uh, like cancel culture, the, the fear of uh, that they're going to come for your job because you've said the wrong thing or believe the wrong thing, that, that sort of thing. That's how it starts. But they say that's not how, you know, it inevitably gets worse and worse. So uh, that's that was the genesis of the book. What I've done in this book is, first of all, I the first half of the book, I try to explain what they're talking about. Why is the things happening here in our liberal capitalist democracy? Why does it remind them of totalitarianism? Is, uh, is our definition of totalitarianism too rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I, I argue, and we can get into this in, in our talk today, uh, that it is too rigid, that what they're seeing is a soft totalitarianism, but a totalitarianism nonetheless. Mm -hmm. The second half of the book is based on my interviews and travels in Russia and Eastern Europe, talking to Christians who, who were dissidents under the communist rule, to find out what their experiences were like and what people, not just Christians, but all people here in the United States and in the West more broadly, can learn from their experience about how we can live through a, uh, a form of totalitarianism without losing our integrity. And I also not only talked to them, but I read uh, through some of the literature of the dissident experience, Solzhenitsyn, Havel, and others, to try to glean practical lessons for American people in our own situation, and also to give people some hope. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a, a good thing, and it comes through in the book, this element of hope. But there's also a, I, I noticed there's also a kind of, I don't know if I would call it cynicism, but a almost a resignation that, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not interpreting you correctly, but that things, it's already too late in a certain sense. That, yeah. Would no, you agree no, with that? That's fair. That's yeah. fair. And, you know, I, I don't want to be defeatist about it, but this thing, the things that I, I identify and my the people I interviewed identify as markers of soft totalitarianism, they've gone very far and people, there, there just seems to be so little resistance to it yeah. because so many people don't even realize it's happening. Yeah. And, and if they do think it's happening, they're, they believe their resistance is simply to vote Republican as if that were going to be sufficient. Now, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm politically involved, but I, I think that to think that politics alone are going to solve this problem and, and meet this challenge is incredibly naive. But mm -hmm. you know, we're still not even talking about effective politics, which, yeah. by the way, would be a politics, I think, that should unite people on the left and the right who believe in old fashioned liberal values. Mm -hmm. but, but we're not there. We're not even talking about this yet. Yeah. Well, I want to read just a little bit from the introduction to the book. Um, Right at the end of the introduction, you're right. You're, you're quoting a Soviet-born emigre who teaches in a university deep in the U.S. heartland and that he stresses the urgency of Americans taking people like her seriously. So she warns, you will not be able to predict what will be held against you tomorrow. You have no idea what completely normal thing you do today or say today will be used against you to destroy you. This is what people in the Soviet Union saw. We know how this works. Then you write, on the other hand, my Czech emigre friend advised me not to waste time writing this book. This is getting to the kind of um, right. you know, resignation or cynicism element. And so she said, people will have to live through it first to understand. He says cynically, anytime I try to explain current events and their meaning to my friends or acquaintances, I am met with blank stares or downright nonsense. Then you write, maybe he is right, but for the sake of his, of his children and of mine, I wrote this book to prove him wrong. Now, one of the things I've seen in my in just the readings that I've done over the years is the I think you you mentioned this in the book that a lot there even in some of the 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 quotes that you include at the beginning of each chapter that for a lot of people who went through this experience in Eastern Europe or in Russia or even in Nazi Germany they couldn't imagine that it, that it could have happened there. Right? So you have this this society that seems to be seems to be stable or seems to be immune to a certain degree for what might imaginably come and then it comes and people are introduced into what could be called a completely new reality an alien reality that they that is completely outside of their their previous experience so it kind of like it hits them like a, a like a railroad train and then you have the people on the outside looking in who might have some idea that something that something over there is is going wrong? Like, of course, there were there were always uh, criticisms of the the Soviet Union and the com and the communist world from the West. But even then, I think even from those critics, they didn't they didn't and couldn't really actually know what it was like to actually live mm -hmm. in that kind of system. So now you have the experience of all of these emigres and people who have lived through it, and then you quote their their thought that that people here just don't get it. You know, I try to explain it to them. And like the, the one at the end there said, well, they're just going to have to have to live through it on your own. Could you just say anything about, about that phenomenon and maybe why you think that it, it might be possible to get through to people the, the information they need to, to take this warning? Well, I can tell you that the Czech emigre and I have stayed in touch. We email almost every day. And he, when, live not by lies hit the new york times bestseller list he wrote me and said you know what maybe i'm wrong <laughs> i didn't think anybody would buy this book but because he's he said you'll have to forgive me i am an eastern european and we're very dark but you know it, it did give him a little bit of hope and i'm, I'm just happy for that but um you know it's it is human nature that we don't um that that we don't and we sort of don't want to think about the worst that could happen because if, if people, I mean, we go back to the Bible, the, the prophets would come warn Israel in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, like, you've got to change, you've got to change, bad things will happen. They wouldn't change, bad things happened, and they learned their lesson. I mean, this is a constant of human nature. But um, I, I, Solzhenitsyn said uh, at the beginning of one of his uh, early editions of the Gulag Archipelago that people, one of the great mistakes people can make is thinking that what happened in Russia couldn't happen in their country. Mm -hmm. He said, given the right uh, set of circumstances, it could happen anywhere on earth. And uh, similarly, Czesław Miłosz, the great Polish intellectual who defected from Poland, and in his book, The Captive Mind, I quote him in, in Live Not By Lies here, he said that the people of Eastern Europe woke up one day rather unhappily to discover that 
the kind of ideas that were only talked about, say, in coffee shops and intellectual circles 20, 30 years earlier were suddenly ruling their lives. Mm -hmm. And this was Miwash's way of saying that, you know, you've got to pay attention to what is discussed in intellectual circles, because when, yeah. when certain ideas take hold among the elites, then that's how they really gain traction over people's lives. Um, and I, I think that I can understand why the people who were so traumatized by communism that they had to get out, why they are uh, acutely uh, aware of similar conditions happening here today, and also uh, about how how um, you know Americans just because of our our historical experience has been one where we've never really had to deal with ideological. Uh, radicalism, and we've never been invaded. Like uh, communism was uh, was forced on the people of Eastern Europe. They just don't think it can happen here, and um, they they're trying to tell us, no, actually it can. And if you're going to stop it, if you're, uh, then you need to be aware of where these ideas and this way of thinking mm -hmm. goes. So just before we we came on to hear uh, me talking with y'all, I was reading uh, something in Quillette. Uh, magazine about uh, a racial panic that's happened at Haverford College's campus in suburban Philadelphia. And uh, it is straight out of um, something that you could have read about Bolshevism. And I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with Marxism, Leninism, but this idea that a, a radical group uh, that was very uh, a vanguard that was extremely insistent on its ideological uh, point of view, even though the leaders gave them everything they demanded, it still wasn't enough. And they managed to intimidate any dissenters on the faculty and among the student body at this very liberal college into silence. I mean, it's it, and now nobody knows what's going to happen at this college. Mm. It, again, a very liberal college that has been radicalized very quickly and totally disrupted by a powerful vanguard of, of radicals among the student body that met no effective resistance from the the school's leadership. You read this sort of thing and then you, you look at what happened in Russian history and you begin to understand why these emigres are so anxious. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's a very interesting reference to that recent development because as you say in your book, uh, Rod, even if the, the totalitarianism doesn't look uh, and, and seem exactly the way it, it was presented in Bolshevik Russia, uh, in Soviet Russia, there is still some version of it that is making itself manifest in today's West. And there, there are very crucial uh, similarities that we need to take a good look at because, uh, you know, as you were saying earlier, there, there is a, uh, a cultural memory uh, that we can learn from, that we can listen to, that uh, if, if it doesn't describe everything exactly in the same way, does get at the very heart of the matter. And so in your book, there is this kind of intersection, I would say, between uh, societal changes, political changes, but also uh, religious ones, where the, the individuals that you interviewed um, had survived their experience of communism and persecution through a religious uh, Christian faith that kept them on the straight and narrow. And this is, a, I think, a very interesting and important feature of your book, which was that uh, this is a kind of spiritual battle that these people experienced and chose to face, uh, but could only have done so in many cases through their, through their faith. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit on that and how that forms your own uh, views of things. Right. The, um, one of the lessons I got from talking to people in, in these different countries is that really the only way to, to have survived totalitarianism and keeping your integrity is to believe in something higher, something greater than yourself. Now, it is the case in uh, Czechoslovakia in particular, uh, Václav Havel uh, and his circle 
they were all atheists. Um, and uh, Václav Benda and his wife Camilla, they're also in my book, they were the only Christians in Havel's inner circle. But in most of the other countries, the dissidents were often believing Christians. And they, they were able to withstand uh, all that the state threw at them because they believed that there was an ultimate reality beyond the material world. And faith in that ultimate reality is what got them through. This one uh, professor I spoke to in Warsaw, he had a really good uh, analogy or a, a simile for the, to describe this. He described the human existence as like a kite. He said, if a kite is, a kite can go very high in the air if it is connected to a, by a string to someone on the earth. But if you cut the string, the kite, however high it is, will, flop, will spiral to the ground. He said, that's how it is for us and God, that, you know, if humanity is connected to the transcendent, to God, the ground of our of transcendence, uh, there we can achieve great things. But if that line is cut, then we make a mess of it. And I, I think that, you know, he was talking about that in connection to the phenomenon you just brought up about how this belief in God, this belief not only in God in general, but in the Christian God and in the, the again, a transcendent values, which is also something that Václav Havel and these others believed in. If not God, they believed that some things were true and that communism itself was a massive lie, a, a, a system built on lies about ultimate truth. And um, if, but the way you prove things are true, and this is a very Kierkegaardian point, I guess you might say, the way you show things are true is by being willing to suffer for them. And that's uh, the fact that Christianity uh, teaches the ultimate meaning of suffering, that if you are willing to suffer and die for Jesus Christ ultimately, but also for the truths that, the, that Christianity proclaims, then uh, that is how you know that these truths, or you demonstrate to others that these, tr these are truths worth living and dying for. Uh, in the book, I talk about the this great Terrence Malick movie that came out earlier this year called uh, a, a hidden um, what is it a hidden I was just reading about a hidden it life, a hidden life Sorry. A hidden, can't believe I can't remember that um, but it's based on the true story of a man who faced down totalitarianism in uh, in Nazi Germany uh, Franz Jägerstädter and uh, Franz uh, there's a moment in the in the movie I don't think this really happened in Franz's life but. Franz goes to a church there where an artist in the village is painting um, images of the Bible on the side of, of the church wall. And the artist tells him, yes, this church is full of people who admire the life of Christ and admire these stories, but they're just admirers. You know, when it really, when it comes down to it and they have to suffer for their faith, then they go away. Jesus didn't call admirers, he called disciples. And the way you prove your discipleship is by being willing to suffer. Um, this is something to go pull out away from Christianity specifically. This is why I think that we in the United States, whether we're Christians or not, um, are particularly susceptible to a form of totalitarianism that proclaims itself and um, you know, institutes itself by manipulating status and comfort. It's more of a brave new world than Orwell's 1984. And um, if we are not willing and able to suffer for our principles, uh, much less our, our religious faith, then we're going to be smashed by, uh, by a system that is prepared to make us suffer. Even something as simple as a loss of status or a loss of a job will roll over for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, just wait. Hello. Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. Bad okay. connection. Bad connection. Sorry about that. Um, and I think you talked about this in your book as well. Was the the state of, um, you know, the American populace and uh, just the way that consumerism has influenced society to such a great extent? Like you say that uh, any kind of discomfort or anything that is uh, difficult or requires suffering is bad because it requires suffering. It's bad essentially, mm -hmm. um, which is like a fundamental contradiction to like the actual reality and to Christianity itself. It's a, it's a contradiction of, of what Christianity preaches. Like, 
in order to bring something about, you have to suffer for it. Like that's the only way that you're going to really value whatever it is that you has is if you actually sacrifice for it. If you don't make any sacrifices for it, then you you don't really care about it and you don't really, you know, you did nothing to earn it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that I really enjoyed about your book was the way that you were able to bring that out and um, just kind of, I guess, reveal the extent to which like there is the um, the social justice warrior aspect where they are uh, critical of uh, suffering, but only in a certain respect, only when it pertains to like specific minority groups. Like mm -hmm. their suffering is paramount um, and everyone else is, is like not non-existent, but irrelevant. irrelevant. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter because they're, they're the power holders. Uh, mm -hmm. even though those are completely contrived categories of people. And I think you also made that point in your book where, you know, the, the, the older white male who's living in poverty um, versus the, you know, Ivy League um, black lesbian professor. Like, you know, one is clearly better off than the other, but still the white man is, um, he's more privileged because he's white. And that's just, that's totally right, irrelevant. Right. Um, so there's like that aspect of it, but then there's also the consumerism and I really like the way that you, you bring it out to say like it, it's getting hit at both fronts, the value of suffering. Right. And right. that is dangerous. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, one thing that really shocked me doing research for this book is reading about in the, when the Bolsheviks came to power, the way Marxism, Leninism decided who was good and who was evil only on the basis of, of social class. So I quote in, in my book, this, um, this uh, order that came down from a KGB official, a predecessor of the KGB, uh, directing the red terror, the, the mass terrorism and murder campaign that the Bolsheviks used to consolidate power. He told his agents, when you go out into the field, you know, don't actually look for guilty people on the basis of what individuals did. Check their social class. You know, if they're bourgeoisie, the middle class, or rich farmers, kill them. If they're not, then they're on our side. Well, you take that same mentality and apply it to our own social justice warriors, uh, where they decide the guilt or innocence of a person doesn't depend on what the individual actually thinks or believes or has done, but only on their identity. I mean, and you can justify any amount of cruelty on the basis of that. And we're accepting it. That's the thing that just blows my mind is that people are rolling over for it. Uh, maybe because we haven't, nobody has told the stories of how this was used in the communist countries to suppress free thought and to, um, and free exercise of religion and all, all forms of freedom. But um, I, I, I think that one thing that we can look at from our own history is the way Martin Luther King and the civil rights uh, marchers and leaders were willing to suffer for the things they knew to be true. And the fact that they were willing to suffer without striking back deeply, deeply uh, struck the consciences of most Americans and led to radical and positive social change. I do wonder, though, uh, to what extent that sort of protest would work in America today, uh, given that we are so post-Christian. I mean, there was at least the civil rights movement in the 60s. It was led by black preachers, and they spoke in the cadences and the symbolic language of the Bible. Well, that's gone. The capacity for Americans to hear that kind of rhetoric and to understand the symbolic language of what the civil rights marchers were doing, we seem to have lost that. So I, I'm not quite sure to what extent are the willingness of people today to suffer, how that will affect mm -hmm. um, a social change. And But we do have, in, in the book I talk about this too, Václav Havel's story of the greengrocer, Havel's greengrocer. It's a fable he told in a very powerful essay he wrote in, in 78, I think it was, called The Power of the Powerless. Havel was the leader of the dissidents in Czechoslovakia. And he told the story, a fictional story of a greengrocer. Let's say the greengrocer under communism has to do what every other store owner does and hang a sign in his window that says, workers of the world unite, the Marxist slogan just to avoid trouble, just to go along to get along. 
Well, what happens, says Havel, if he decides one day not to hang the sign, to take the sign down? What happens to him? The authorities come, he loses his business, he is an outcast, his kids can't go to college, he can't travel, and so on and so forth. He takes a serious hit. But what he has done by his act of uh, resistance, as simple and as small as it was, is to show to everybody else that it is possible to live not by lies. That is to say, to live uh, and survive without uh, having to say that you agree with the system, that you accept the lies that you're supposed to tell so you can get along in the system. And most people will look at him and think he, maybe he's a fool or a bad man for doing that, but there will be others who see his protest and realize, you know what, these are lies we're living in, and that will grow and grow and grow, the, the, his act of integrity. I think that we're going to have to see something like that here before this madness stops. We're going to have to see people willing to sacrifice uh, themselves to inspire others to stand up as well. And one thing I believe that uh, people, whether they're people of faith or people who believe in, in uh, old fashioned liberal ideals have to do is to make it easier for people within corporations, universities, and these structures, make it easier for them to stand up and even sacrifice their jobs. And one way we can do that is by supporting them, standing up for them when they do that, and also standing up not just, not just you know, rhetorically, in public, but by giving money to help them and their families support themselves uh, when they make these moves. Mm -hmm. That brings to mind a couple things. Um, one of my favorite books was written by a, <clears throat> a Polish exile, um, Andrew Wobachevsky. He was a psychologist in, uh, in Poland, and he wrote a book called Political Ponderology, which was his attempt to um, account for the phenomenon of, you know, totalitarianism from a from the perspective of um, the psychological science that he that he um, acquired before the institution of of um, communism in, in Poland and uh, one of the things that he writes about in in his chapter on religion and this system which he calls pathocracy um, basically being meaning, meaning rule of the of the sick or the ill or the diseased because um, he saw that he saw communism as uh, the essence of communism as experienced in the Eastern Bloc as um, the product of um, diseased minds. Um, we can get into that if, if we want later. But he, he said that when it comes to religion, if a country f falls to a, let's say, a, a homegrown um, rise of a revolutionary totalitarian movement, that the the responsibility for that it pretty much lies with the with the the churches the, with the church that they have failed in their they have failed their function in society if if they've allowed allowed a society to become weakened to the point where it becomes susceptible to that kind of thing but he said once it is there um religion the then becomes the kind of the sine qua non of not only resistance but survival, and that um, it, it's a it's a very dry work uh, with with stilted like uh, chunky writing, but mm -hmm. clunky writing. But uh, I'll paraphrase something he wrote. He said something like, um, after after some years in in a system like this, religion becomes it leave uh, religion ceases to be just like tradition, dogma, and um, uh, one other negative aspect, you know, associated with just old old religion that's kind of dry and ossified and not doing its job, and it becomes faith, mm. because it's almost like the well, it is that the the suffering caused by living in this system, the atomization, the setting people against each other, creates the crucible of suffering that then necessitates, well, it, it not only necessitates a, a life of faith, but it almost like forces it out. Like, you know, like striking a piezoelectric stone or something. It's like by, by being hammered, something um, lightens, just um, awakens within. And some of the accounts that you give in the book of some of these Christian distance are just beautiful. Um, it, whether it's a short anecdote or a long story or a long conversation, two that come to mind, one is the one um, I can't remember who it is, but um, he was the guy that said that um, 
oh, now my mind's going blank. The he had a realization when he was arrested that um, basically it was the the greatest thing he can do in 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 life would be to die for for God for his fit you know for his faith for for the Dr. truth. Sylvester Kirch Mary that would who that was he was in Bratislava, mm -hmm. and he yeah you know, I think he was in the car with the with his arresting officers and he just started laughing, and uh, and they weren't very pleased with that. That also reminded me of a, of a story that Andrew Wobachevsky tells about his own arrests. He, he reports that uh, he was arrested and tortured three times, I believe. On the fourth time he was arrested, he was then um, basically given his passport and sent to, and told to leave the country. But on the first time that he was arrested, he, he didn't have any of that uh, clarity. It was, mm -hmm. it was, um, he, he, he the whole experience was almost like a dream for him. He was arrested. Um, I believe, I, I can't remember if he was tortured that first, during that first arrest, but, um, afterwards, you know, they let him go, um, just, just as arbitrarily as they had arrested him. And he mm -hmm. was just, he was just left thinking like, you know, I think the, the quote that he gives is he, he said something like, you know, God, what, like, wh where are you in this world? You know, what's going on? How can this happen? But on the second or third time that he was arrested and, and tortured, he got he he accessed this inner um, kind of strength and confidence, and he just looked at the you know out of his interrogators. He looked at the one that was uh, the 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 head guy, like the meanest one, just with you know just looked him directly in the eye and said, paraphrasing, you know, I wonder why it is that people in your profession end up in the mental institute, you know, after so many years. And the the, the guy looked at him and said, you know. What are you talking about? But it was that it was that confidence that he showed, and actually cracking a joke, even if it was at the other guy's expense, that th the guards then actually treated him pretty well from then on, and and let him go, like you know, some days later. But so the the inspiring thing about these stories, and like the ones the the ones that you share in this book, is, is the the inner strength that yeah. um, that that faith can prov faith can and did provide for all these people to not only let them survive but it gave their lives meaning and they were the ones that could that could sit through you know solitary confinement and torture and not only to to not only not be broken by it but to actually be refined by it yeah that's that's it and how do you, what is the difference between those who were refined by it and those who were broken by it I, that would require a longer book, but I, I, I did write in, in Live Not By Lies about this experience that Timo Krishka had. Timo Krishka is a Slovak photographer who was a child when communism ended, a little boy, so he has no real memory of communism. But he ended up doing a, a book, a, foot, a, a photographic uh, book of photographic essays and interviews with elderly Slovaks who had been put in prison for their faith. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And he went to visit them and make, you know, take their portraits and talk to them. And it really changed his life, Timo said, because it, all of these people, most of them are still quite poor. And uh, they had, uh, some of them had been tortured and lived in solitary and so forth. But they all told him that the times they were in prison were among the most meaningful times of their lives because that was when, when they had everything taken from them, that was when they had to fall back entirely on God. And uh, Timo began to understand from the people he was talking to, who just had this inner light glowing, how rich their lives were and how impoverished his own life was, even though he had vastly more freedom and more material wealth than his parents and grandparents' generation had, but he didn't have what they had. And he said it, it, it led him to a, a deep inner repentance. Similarly, uh, Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago, he writes these incredible words, bless you prison. You know, this was a man who was, uh, had the worst that the 20th century could throw at anybody, uh, absent the gas chambers, thrown at him. And yet he looked at it, looked back on it as a blessing because it awakened his moral conscience and his religious conscience. That orientation towards suffering is the only way we can survive it, I think, without being cracked. And uh, here in, in the United States, you know, I, I really don't see anything like the Gulag Archipelago coming towards us. It may one day, but I don't think it's going to happen. But I don't think it really needs to because we are so soft about suffering and so unused to it. And we've been so um, 
acculturated to a culture of middle class convenience. I'm as guilty as anybody else, right? I mean, I'm a hobbit. I, I have, uh, I, I like to sit in my on my couch and drink my my nice tea and, you know, have all the creature comforts. But I think these things are going to be taken from us. In fact, I think that the COVID. Uh, this year of COVID has been, in a way, uh, a dry run for a future of, of deprivation. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm one of these people who believes that COVID is real. Don't get me wrong here, but I think that we have been shown that our lives can be, our normal lives can be radically disrupted by things we can't control, and if we can't, if we manage, uh, if we can't manage to get through this. Uh, in a stable way and not only survive it, but thrive it, how much worse will it be when there are things that are actually done to us that make things life much harder for us? Mm -hmm. I, to be honest, I, I've gone back this year, back when COVID, the lockdowns first started, we couldn't have church. I'm, I'm Eastern Orthodox and we couldn't go to liturgy. And uh, there were some people in our church who were understandably really upset by this because they missed having church. And, and I felt the same way about it because I, I church is such an important part of my life and my family's life. But I, I went back to the stories that I had read of uh, the Eastern Europeans and the Russians uh, who, un, who suffered so much more. And it wasn't a case of like, oh, quit feeling sorry for yourself. It could always be worse, though that was true. It was rather that these people had to learn how to deal with this in the long run. Not a single one of the, the dissidents I talked to ever thought they would live to see the end of communism. So they had to build a life for themselves, a life of integrity and a life of faith, uh, believing that they were always going to live in captivity. Mm. I think that there's a lot we can learn from that about um, learning how to abide in suffering. Mm. Well, maybe, well, along those lines, yeah. uh, th there were, these um, very proactive people that you uh, discuss in your book, uh, Kolokovic, who was a gentleman who could see uh, what en encroaching communism was going to do uh, in Eastern Europe uh, during the 40s, I believe, and w was able to talk to people, create uh, networks of uh, discussion groups and, and classes and social meetings, and really had an incredible vision for how to uh, offset the negative effects of communism among the faithful and, and among uh, people who were just open to his message, it seemed. And I, I thought that there was a very uh, powerful uh, message there in your discussion of his um, see, judge, act, and, sure. and, his, and his networking ability and, and his ability to see so far ahead and, and plan for those times with individuals who shared his vision um, for, for networking, for keeping strong and keeping faith uh, in, in groups. And I wonder if you might expand on that, Rod, and, and talk about that, um, that network that he created. Yeah, I'm so glad you uh, asked about Father Kolakovic. He He's this unsung hero of the Cold War. I knew nothing about him until I went to Bratislava to speak at a conference and to do some research on the underground church there for my book. And I learned that he was the reason. Uh, he was born Tomislav Poglayan in Croatia. Uh, that was his home country and became a Jesuit priest. In 1943, he was there in Zagreb doing anti-Nazi work. Uh, and he got a tip that the Gestapo was coming for him. So uh, he slipped out of the country and went to his mother's homeland, Slovakia, nearby, and adopted her last name, Kolakovic. And he began teaching at the Catholic University in Bratislava. And because earlier in his career he had trained in the Vatican to do missionary work in the Soviet Union, he understood deeply the communist mindset. And that gave him insight into what was likely to happen in Czechoslovakia after the war was over. He told his students, look, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this thing. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be here. We're not going to be able to get rid of them. And the first thing the communists are going to do is come after the church. We have to get ready. Well, the bishops, the Catholic bishops there didn't want to hear this. They accused him of being an alarmist, of upsetting people for no reason. 
but uh, he didn't listen because he knew what was coming. So what he did was organize these student groups, uh, started out as prayer groups, but they were also discussion groups. And they were modeled after um, a program that he had learned about uh, the, the, the young Catholic wor or workers, I think they were called in Belgium, uh, which was a, a, a social movement to get working class Catholics together, youth together to talk about social problems and social reform. Uh, and they had a model called See, Judge, Act. It was a simple model for how to analyze and, and uh, social problems and how to talk about them as Catholics, about what should we do, and then make a decision to act. Well, Kolokovic brought that to his own groups. He called them the family uh, in Slovakia. He started one in Bratislava, and they spread quickly all around the country. And e each town of any size had... Uh, a chapter of the family. And all they would do was this, they would come together for prayer, but they were also come to hear lectures about um, economics, sociology, and so forth, and to apply the, their faith and their knowledge to analyzing what was happening in the real world there in Slovakia. And for them, that meant also preparing for the coming of totalitarianism and a time when the church would be suppressed. So they would learn practical things too, like how to resist an interrogation. Now you could imagine to the bishops, this sounded crazy, but sure enough, when the Iron Curtain fell and they kicked Kolokovich out, the first thing the Soviet, the communists did, the Soviet puppet government did come after the churches mm -hmm. and they neutralized the priest because they thought, and it was a reasonable theory that you know, this is uh, Catholicism is a hierarchical religion. And if we can just get the priest and neutralize them, then the, the church will be suppressed. Kolokovic knew that's how they thought. And so all the lay people that he had helped prepare for leadership, they took the ball. And they and a few priests who had uh, allied themselves with Kolokovic, they built the underground church. And they were the only meaningful resistance to communism for the next 40 years. I dedicate Live Not By Lies to Father Kolokovic because I think that we are in a Kolokovic moment here in the United States now. Uh, I don't know when the Iron Curtain or the whatever the equivalent would be will, is going to fall. It may be a slow noose sort of thing around the church and around people who dissent from the regime, even if they're non-religious, but I think it's going to come. And I think that we have to right now start building these networks of groups who can see, judge, and act. I think it's important, too, that in uh, Kolokovic's world, it was young people who took the initiative because they were the ones who were open to his ideas, and they were the ones also who didn't have a lot to lose. And uh, they, they could hear what he was saying because they weren't so invested emotionally and otherwise in the existing order. I think people my age, I'm 53 now, people my age and older really don't want to believe that things, that, that bad things could happen here. Young people, though, who haven't had, uh, who don't have that same sort of investment, I think they are more open to talking about these things. Mm -hmm. I can also say real quick that uh, Victor Popkov is somebody I mentioned in, in Live Not By Lies. He's a Russian who became a Christian in the early 1970s and ended up going to prison for his role in the underground church in, in the late Soviet period. Uh, Viktor Popkov told me that he, as a young man, he was not raised with religion at all, but he was so uh, miserable uh, with the, the sterility and the, just the crushing boredom of life in the Soviet Union in the 1960s. And he began to search for the meaning of life the only people he saw around him who seemed to have any kind of uh, connection to something living were the young Christians. Uh, similarly, in Russia in that era, there was a priest I write about in the book called Father Dmitry Dudko, who is a very brave Orthodox priest who began to speak out openly. Not He wouldn't challenge the system directly. That would have got him sent to prison straight away. But he just talked about the meaning of life and, and that life does have meaning and purpose. And people began to come, all, all kinds of people, people who were Jewish, people who were atheists. They just wanted to see this man who had something. He was in touch with something beyond himself that gave them hope. And I, I think that we're going to be looking for the same sort of people here eventually. Mm-hmm.
Well, Rod, this, this I, I, you don't talk about this in the book, but it just came to mind when you were, my mind was kind of a free associating while you were talking there, and, and the question came to me. Do you know, or have you heard of, um, during this, the, the, during this period in the Soviet Union, were there similar cells of resistance, like in the in the Muslim parts of the of the country? Like, because have you heard anything about that? Or? I haven't. I wouldn't be surprised if there yeah. had been, but I just haven't heard about it. I focus. I, yeah. I wrote the book as a Christian for Christians, but mm -hmm. I'm finding to my my surprise and delight that in this country. There are people who aren't Christians who are uh, embracing the book. Barry Weiss, the secular liberal Jewish writer who resigned from the New York Times in protest of the way wokeness is taking over that newsroom, she has become a fan of the book and recommended the book. Um, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hyde, who have a popular podcast, a dark horse podcast, they're both secular leftist um, atheists, but they have embraced the book too because they themselves have had to live with soft totalitarianism that drove them out of their college evergreen state in washington mm -hmm. so um i've just been delighted to call these people my new friends and allies because this is the sort of thing that that we're going to need i in live not by lies i i talk about how camilla bendova in prague as well as a man named uh, Franciszek Miklochko in Bratislava talked about how you needed allies anywhere. There were yeah. so few people in those countries who were willing to take a stand of any kind. Most everybody kept their heads down and just tried to stay out of trouble. But when you, so when you found somebody who would do it, even if they, whether they believed in God or not, you needed to be friends with them and to find out what you had in common, how you could help each other. I think we're in a similar situation here. Hmm. And, one of the in that second part of the book where you talk about all of these practices, these um, these these things that can and should be put into practice now in order to have them like like Kolakovich was able to do to to get them started so that they were established by the time they became absolutely necessary. Um, one of the things is like you mentioned in passing to to these small church groups, like small small church meetings among the lay uh, members of the church. And there's um, one of the, oh, I've got a page number here. Let me just find the, what I'm thinking about it, about yeah. in the book. Let's turn to scripture and. Uh, we'll... Yeah, let's turn to scripture <laughs> <laughs> on uh, page one, uh, chapter. <laughs> well, in standing in solidarity is the chapter on page one, yes. 167. Um, um, you quote, um, oh, I'm going to butcher this name, Shemulchik. Yeah, sure. That's perfect. That's oh. it. Jan Schmultzik. Great. He says at the at the bottom of the page, um, when you ask that question, oh, this is, um, why did you get involved? When you ask that question, you are really asking about where we find the meaning of the underground church. It was in small community. Only in small communities could people feel free. And so I'm relating that. Uh, well, maybe just talk about that. Um, talk about what he meant by that and how we can apply that um, to our lives, you know, now, today, here. Yeah, because we're incarnational creatures. You know, the abstract ideals have to become real in the material world by living them out. Jan Shemulczyk told me this, this, this story standing in uh, an underground chamber in Bratislava, uh, it was incredible how we got there. We He took me to this ordinary house in suburban Bratislava that had been used by the underground church. The man who lived there back in the 1980s was a Catholic priest, secretly ordained, but he, he was disguised as a worker. And in the basement of this house, actually under the basement, there was a tunnel. And he took me into this tunnel that you had, it was behind a hidden door. You went into this tunnel and you came up in a secret room that was behind a basement wall. In this tiny chamber, there was an offset printer. It's still there that the, uh, some evangelicals in the Netherlands smuggled into Bratislava uh, to help the underground Catholic Church back in the 1980s. And for 10 years, in that little room, they printed prayer books, gospels, catechisms, things like that to keep the underground church going. And they were never discovered. 
but it was an elaborate movement or elaborate scheme to do this that uh, Shmulchik was part of a small group of college students, Catholic college students, who had come to the house every week to bind together the things that had been printed by Samizdat. And he didn't even know, none of them knew that this was happening in that secret chamber under the house because they, that was how it, it had to be. If, if mm -hmm. any of them, if they had been arrested, they would have been tortured and sent to prison, but yeah. the church had to protect itself. Shemulchik said, and, and, and he goes on to say in the passage you were talking about, about how that as a college student is what helped his faith become real and helped him to feel free, that he wasn't just alone, that he had, I don't know, three or four other young men who were willing to take the same risks that he was taking to serve God and to serve the underground church, people that they might never know because they couldn't know them, but they had a mission they had a reason to risk their lives and their freedom, and that gave them freedom. He says that this is the only place he felt free was when he was in these small groups with people who shared his faith and who shared his commitment to risking their lives for something higher. Um, I, I think that you know, the, the thing that totalitarianism depends on, certainly communist totalitarianism, and I guess any totalitarianism, is keeping people divided and atomized in fact, Hannah Arendt said in her book, uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism, when she went back to try to analyze after the end of the Second World War, why so many Germans had given themselves over to Nazi totalitarianism and why so many Russians had embraced um, Bolshevik totalitarianism, the number one reason was the loneliness, the mass loneliness of people mm -hmm. and the sense of atomization of not being connected to anybody else, to any institution, to any way of life. Uh, totalitarian movements slipped in there and gave people what they were longing for, that a deeper sense of meaning and solidarity. It was fake, but it was something. What Shemulchik was saying there about the small groups is that this was something real. You know, the, the state only wanted people to be, have solidarity in ways that it could control, but it really kept them atomized and afraid of each other. Uh, but Shemulchik said you know, when he was there working with those others, he knew that they were real because they were all willing to suffer again, there we go, to suffer or to rather to risk suffering in prison for the sake of their cause. And that was real freedom. I think that in our case, you know, we're clearly a society that is um, just completely eaten up with loneliness and atomization. Uh, and this has not happened because the state has forced it on us. It has happened because you know, our economy and the way we've chosen to live and the way the technology we've embraced has brought this to us. I'm as much a victim of it as anybody else. You know, I'm sitting here in my house um, and before COVID started, you know, I'm connected to a lot of people all over the world every day by the internet, but I can't tell you who my neighbors are. And that's on me, that's my fault. Nobody sports that on me. And I know a lot of people who are like that. But uh, I, I think that the hardship of soft totalitarianism, when it comes, it will force those who want freedom, who, who want some reason to live higher than themselves, to seek each other out and to build these bonds of, of real community. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, Václav Benda, I don't talk about it in Live Not By Lies, but I do talk about it in my previous book, The Benedict Option, uh, Václav Benda, who, uh, whose wife Camilla is in Live Not By Lies, under communism, he realized that the way, the best way he could resist it was to try to rebuild a sense of community that totalitarianism had destroyed. So he came up with this idea he called the parallel polis. He said, look, in Czechoslovakia, we can't have a real politics, a free politics, where people can choose to participate in the order. Uh, and have some sense of, of democratic accountability. But that doesn't mean that we have the right as Christians or as, uh, as individuals to sit at home and submit to it. He believed that, that Christians and others should create a parallel uh, community of people that was based on, on actual consent and participation, not to replace the communist um, the communist system because that wasn't possible, but rather to remind people who they were, to remind people what it means to be human and what it means to be a neighbor. Uh, so for Václav Benda, a simple act of people getting together to share a meal 
was a political act because it was something that would help rebuild rebuild a real community. Well, Rod, your your book is uh, is actually it's it's really impressive impressively broad in some ways because you take some time to discuss the uh, the social credit system in in uh, China and in the U.S. and what big tech and surveillance technology and uh, all the modern conveniences that we've become so used to relying upon um, are doing to us. So what you've done, I think, is to create this much larger picture of totalitarianism uh, in a few different forms and how it's been manifesting. And so what's interesting to me is that, you know, you you have this... uh, you know, the radical left ideological uh, craziness uh, that's been on display for the past uh, six or so years, if not more. And then you also have the the kind of top-down corporate corporatocracy and big tech surveillance and, uh, and, and that whole element. And uh, something that, that's, that may fall outside of your book a little bit is the, uh, the, the mass kind of vandalism against uh, institutions of Christianity, particularly in Europe, but also some in the U.S., mm-hmm. and and also this move against calling Christmas Christmas. So I guess my point is that I, we're, we're seeing this, um, we're seeing something coming at us at, at several different angles that are all quite pointed. Uh, I'm 49 years old. You said you're 53. Uh, this is a very different world uh, I feel like I'm living in than when I grew up. And so um, what, 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 if anything, can we say is actually occurring? Is the whole world going uh, bonkers at, at around the same time? Is there, is, are, are all of these developments interlocked or interconnected in some fashion? Or I was wondering yeah. what you thought all this is. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a huge question. And uh if it makes you feel any better, even the people uh, who live through communism who can see that something big is coming, even they can't say exactly what it is. And they freely admitted that to me. This one Slovak priest said that uh, in some ways this is more difficult than communism. He said under communism, it was easy to tell what was good and what was evil. And the gospel shone a clear light through that darkness. But now, the the gospel the light of the gospel only hits fog and i think the part of the reason is because this new totalitarianism does mimic the best parts of christianity and the best parts of liberal humanism um rene gerard the the 20th century cultural critic just a brilliant intellectual he he wrote in the year 2000 i quote him in the book as saying that this concern for the victim, which is something that Christianity has always had, and that the, uh, the, since the Enlightenment period, which was a secularization of Christian uh, moral values, you know, the, our democratic societies have had at an increasing uh, level, this concern for the victim and for the oppressed has become so intense that it threatens to become something totalitarian. The word that Rene Girard used, and uh, a form of constant inquisition. And so when you have, uh, for example, the, this abuse of language, uh, the term anti-racism, this is a book that is, uh, the book by Ibram Kendi, How to Be Anti-Racist has become a must read for so many within institutions and companies. Kendi has this incredibly Manichaean and simplistic idea about race, either you're anti-racist, as he describes it, or you're a racist. There's no middle ground, there's no ambiguity. Uh, You've had black intellectuals like Thomas Chatterton Williams and John McWhorter call this out as clearly uh, uh, simplistic and even totalitarian, but this is what's going on now. But the word anti-racist is used in a highly ideological way, in a way that George Orwell talked about to um, to frame the discussion. So, if you stand up to anti-racism programs, then you, by definition, must be a racist. Mm-hmm. So and this is a way of manipulation to make it impossible to think critically about what is being proposed because nobody wants to be a racist, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, a, it's a, a brilliant way of manipulating 
the discourse and manipulating the way people understand reality. In my book, I, I, this Polish professor in Warsaw told me that it's something he worries about a lot with his own students in, of the post-communist generation. He said, we all under communism, we could see how the authorities were changing language and manipulating language, redefining co basic concepts to, to uh, control us. And there was that consciousness of what was being done and being done so ham-handedly uh, was a form of defense. He said, kids today uh, don't have, they have not had that experience. They're so much easier to manipulate, so much more susceptible to this ideological manipulation. And, uh, you know, you were talking about the social credit system. This, uh, I'm glad you brought it up because this, I believe, is the main way that soft totalitarianism will manifest itself and, and, and work in our society. For those uh, of your listeners who don't know, the social credit system is something that the Chinese have developed and implemented or are implementing in their country now. What they do is they take all the data that are generated by ordinary Chinese people using their smartphones and they're in that increasingly cashless society, you have to use your smartphones to do everyday purchases. So they're taking all the data from smartphones, from using the internet and from GPS coordinates, from uh, cameras on the street, and they're feeding it all into main, a main computer system. This is slightly simplistic, but this is how it's working. Mm -hmm. And it keeps a constant tally of each individual Chinese citizen of whether they've done the right thing, socially positive things, or socially negative things. If you are socially positive, meaning you do things like download the speeches of Xi Jinping or other things that can be measured by, uh, by the data, by the algorithms analyzing your data, you get a higher rating and you get better jobs, you get access, to, kids get access to the best universities and so forth. If you have a lower rating, which you get by doing things like going to church or, or spending time or being at least friends on social media with other bad people, well, you get a lower rating and suddenly you find your privileges constricted. It can even go to the point where you can be shut out from buying and selling in the economy. Uh, because if all the, the purchasing has to be done digital, digitally in a cashless economy, then shutting you off from the economy is a matter simply of flipping a switch. Well, this is how the Chinese do it. And it's interesting. They, they can manage to have a police state without having to send the police to people's door, doors to yell at them. We can do this in America, too. The same data are being harvested by not by the state in our case, but by major corporations, Google, Amazon and so forth. And it's simply a matter of deciding to weaponize that to marginalize uh, people who are dissenters, who are dissidents, who are deplorables and so on and so forth, who don't fit the idea of what the people who run these companies think is socially positive. Mm -hmm. I think it's only a matter of time before that happens. I saw just last week, somebody was putting on Twitter, there's an app you can get for your phone that will uh, change the color of social media uh, text and social media messages if the app's algorithm decides that the person writing it is anti-transgender or pro-transgender. Now, I mean, it seems so silly. It's called Shinigami odds. It seems so silly, but... Here you have someone, if they've made their mind up that they don't want to have any contact at all with any impure person who might have said something that is anti-transgender, all they have to do is see the color of the text that somebody could be writing about nothing having to do with transgenderism. The, just the color of the text will, will mark them out as deplorable, as enemies of the people, as bigoted, whatever you want to call it. The fact that these things exist and people are beginning to rely on them as tools to determine who is pure and who is not is how totalitarianism is going to come here, even if the state never gets involved. I think the state will get involved at some point, but this is one reason why it's so hard for Americans to recognize this as totalitarian. If you had uh, an agent for the government from the FBI show up at your door and say, uh, sir, madam, we'd like to install this speaker in your house. It will allow you to order things uh, conveniently to be sent to you just by using your voice, but it will also be listening to some of what you have to say. You would tell the government to, to go take a hike. But when it's sold by Amazon and it's sold as purely consumer convenience, we'll not only welcome that into our houses, we'll pay for it. Mm -hmm. 
sorry, end of sermon. I've just been on my high horse. Saying, <laughs> Amen. You see what I mean? Though? Yeah. Once, you, once you start reading this stuff, like yeah. Shoshana mm-hmm. Zubat's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, and you see how ubiquitous mm-hmm. it is and how we have just been so anesthetized into accepting this into our lives to the point where suddenly you can't do without it. Mm-hmm. You know? And, and, see how we are. Mm-hmm. and those kinds of things, they're already being, I'd say, rolled out on a trial basis for extreme cases. Like I know people online or have heard of people who have been totally locked out of PayPal. You know, these were, or YouTube, you know, people who relied for their income on either PayPal or YouTube or both or Patreon who have um, just gotten blocked, you know, we, for political reasons, for right. you, you have said something that we don't like you, like you like you saying, so we are going to block you from being able to receive money. And mm-hmm. it's, it's you see this. totalitarianism yep. without the state. You can still do it just by virtue of the big business. But the, the, the way they are able to get away with it right now is because um, most, most uh, well, I'd say for some of these people, some of these individuals that I'm aware of, most people would probably think, oh, it's a good thing that they don't, that they're being cut off, Right. Um, it's a good thing that they're being banned. That's not the kind of person that I want to have free speech. And in, for some cases, I can I can kind of agree with them. I'd say, oh, well, I can kind of see that why why you'd want that person totally cut off. But at the same time, I'm totally against cutting them off because that opens so many doors. Um, it it sets the precedent sets the precedent, and that's kind of why I see it almost as a trial run. It's it's like okay, well, let's see how much we can get away with. Can we can we actually cut people off from financial institutions from being able to to receive money digitally can we can we ruin their lives like this well yes we can and you know it didn't cause any big waves because who's going to care about some um you know um you know loser guy on the internet who who makes uh, offensive stuff and who who no one knows who who probably only makes you know 20 grand a year um not a not a big personality not a big celebrity who's going to care who's going to find out about it and that but that sets the the precedent and then you then you look at a country like china where this kind of thing is already um institutionalized mm-hmm. and and you see those those yeah. two things and that is not a uh that doesn't that doesn't give much hope for for this never happening you know right and do you know in china this is the thing that blows my mind the social credit system is actually popular yeah and uh people want that and why do they want that because that communism destroyed all traditions, all social life. Mm -hmm. And you can't live that way. You don't know who you can trust anymore. And people will say, Chinese living there today will say that at least this tells us, you can look at somebody's social credit rating, it's all public, you know who you can trust. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems crazy to us, but we don't know what it's like to live in a society where uh, civil society has been completely destroyed and people need some basis to know that they're not going to be cheated. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I think something, we're talking about alienation and atomization here. Well, we don't have it to the extent that the Chinese did, but we're getting it more and more. And you know, there are people who will want to know or feel like they, they, they wanna know that the shop they're going to, that these are decent people, which is how you get things like the Havel's Green Gross are putting Workers of the World Unite. Well. Today, the Hubble's Green Grocer sign might be a pride flag or, you know, you name it, something to say that, you know, Black Lives Matter, something like that to say that I'm good, I'm pure, don't harm me. Yep. Uh, you know, you're talking about bad people being uh, demonetized. I read recently that in the UK, some far right activists have been denied bank accounts. Um, mm-hmm. They, I'm talking about just ordinary bank accounts for checking and uh, and they weren't able to to get access to it because the banks have the right to refuse your business. Well, these are awful people. You know, they say racist things, and they're not the kind of people that I want to see thrive. But you're right. If these people are are not allowed to have bank accounts, that means they're not allowed to participate in the modern economy. Where do you draw the line? You know, today it's them. What about tomorrow if it's like people who go to church or people who vote Tory or you know, just you name it. It, mm-hmm. it? Once the principle is established, there's no stopping it. Mm-hmm. And it can also serve uh, to bolster that person. Um, I can't think of a specific example, but, you know, let's say like an actual racist individual. 
um, was deplatformed uh, and was not, it was disallowed a basic a bank account. They weren't allowed to get one. Well, it can radicalize a person. Yeah, it can radicalize oh. the person by saying like, look, I'm justified in saying what I say because I'm not allowed to say it. That, that proves that I'm right. That's, mm -hmm. that's the exact opposite of the thing that you want to do. If they're crazy, right? If they're just crazy. You want them let, to speak as loudly as yes, possible. Let them talk to everyone because then everyone's going to see that they're crazy and it's, and it's not going to go anywhere because they've just added themselves as crazy. But by denying them a platform, you're actually creating the very problem that you're setting out to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And you have no one to blame but yourself. I think you're right about that. And, you know, one of the, I think one of the most important moments uh, culturally in this country on the road to soft totalitarianism happened in 2015, October 2015, at Yale University. Uh, you guys might have seen this. You can see it uh, on YouTube. Uh, that was when they had this big controversy on campus about uh, Halloween costumes. Mm, University yep. had sent out something saying, be careful about what you wear, don't wear offensive costumes. Erica Christakis, who is a professor there, she and her husband, Nicholas, also a professor, were housemasters of this one of the residential colleges. And she just sent out an email to the members of that college saying, really, is this something that the university should be concerning itself with, telling adults what they can and get wear on Halloween? The students came against her so hard. They accused her of being racist and not loving them, not caring for them. Uh, it all came down to this thing that you can see on YouTube where her husband, Nicholas, went out on the quad at their college and tried to engage this uh, large group of protesting students in a reasonable, rational dialogue about this. He was, he's a baby boomer and he was doing just the model of rational discourse, listening to them, uh, offering feedback and trying to engage them. They weren't having it. They just, this mob of young people just shrieked at him. Some of them sobbed. They were in a total moral hysteria. They cursed him. Of course, Yale University sided with the students against the Christakis. And uh, that showed me right there that, the, that when the people who run institutions, who have the power to enforce norms, when they yield to the mob, you know, we're done for. And uh, I, I think that the sort of people who who care about being called racist and who don't want to be racist or bigoted when they are run over and there's nothing they can do to redeem themselves in the eyes of these activists, then what it does is it empowers the people who actually are racist and who don't care if you call them a racist. They're proud to be racist. Those become the people who end up being seen by many others as brave because they stood up to the mob. You know, and I think that's a really bad situation for people like me and, and, and you who want to live in a decent, honorable, you know, old fashioned liberal society where people are free to dissent without losing their jobs and without having their lives threatened and their, uh, and their, their families put at risk. Mm -hmm. Well, Rod, how are we doing for time? Um, do you have, yeah, just, have a, can, can we go about five or 10 more minutes? Sure. Um, did, did either of you guys have a final question? If not, well, can... just a comment, really, and that is that um, in your discussion, getting back to the area of, of suffering for truth, uh, that your explication of it is very nuanced, um, which I appreciated. Uh, the idea being that um, while, while some suffering may be involved and self-sacrifice may be necessary, uh, that we shouldn't necessarily be you know, seeking to suffer and, mm -hmm. and making martyrs of ourselves, um, but that there is a, a, a certain openness and receptivity to those opportunities where, you know, there might be something to suffer for, that, that an individual may be uniquely uh, prepared to uh, engage in or, or, or find that, okay, this is actually my fight and, mm -hmm. and I... Uh, th this is where I demonstrate to, to the best of my ability my my faith that that my uh, belief in something higher um, mm -hmm. is or it can assist me at this time and 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 this is the this is the proof of it. Uh, so I I wonder if you might flesh that out a little bit, Rod. Hmm. Well, you know, you, you say that, it reminds me of sitting with Father Kirill Kaleda, 
uh, at his rectory in Russia at Butovo Field. Uh, Butovo Field is a place south of Moscow in the farthest southern outreaches of Moscow, where in the 1930s and a 14 month period, the KGB executed 21,000 political prisoners on this field. Mm-hmm. And uh, today, uh, thanks largely to the work of this uh, tireless Orthodox priest, Father Kirill Kaleda, uh, the, that space has been consecrated as Russia's national monument to victims of political violence. And um, I went there on the day uh, to visit it on the day of, the, of remembrance, and I watched a, a large group of Russians standing there in the cold rain reading out aloud the names of each victim who was killed there. And after it was over, I went to talk to Father Kirill to interview him for the book. And one thing he told me is that we must always be ready to suffer if that is called asked of us. But as you point out, we shouldn't go out and seek it out. Our faith doesn't require us to seek it out. And one has to be really um, use prudential judgment. You know, not every, you can't die on every single hill. There may be times when you have to keep your mouth shut or uh, you know, walk on by something that offends you because there's a, there's a greater battle to be fought. The difficulty though, is trying to, trying to know when this is a stand I have to take and when I can pass it by. Because if you start by saying, well, I'm not gonna stand up against this thing. I'm gonna wait till the big thing comes along you'll eventually talk yourself out of standing up at all. Mm-hmm. I, I talk in, in Live Not By Lies about this thing called Ketman, uh, Mis, uh, Miłosz, uh, Ch- the Czesław Miłosz, the Polish dissident. He writes in his book, The Captive Mind, about a phenomenon he calls Ketman. It's a Persian word, meaning the official hypocrisy, the, the, the mask that everybody has to wear in a system where it's too dangerous to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, you get to a point, though, where if you wear the mask too often, the mask becomes your face. And this is the, the real challenge. And I don't think there's a clear formula that tells us what we have to do in every single situation. It requires the um, mm-hmm. judgment. And it requires, it's a sort of thing that we can only really uh, work out talking to people we respect who share our values and who don't want to see us suffer, but who also know that suffering can be required of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, nowadays, it's, I, I hear from people all the time who say that they try to talk to their pastors about the things they're struggling with in their pastors in the workplace with whether or not they should stand up and be countered or they you know, stand up uh, in this or that way. And the pastors don't even know what they're talking about because the pastors have been so accustomed to thinking of Christianity as kind of a self-help therapeutic uh, philosophy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of getting a far feel from your question there, but uh, I, I think that it really does become uh, an issue and that people like me, I, I, my job is independent. You know, I work for a magazine, they're happy to have me. I can say what I want to uh, working for this conservative magazine, but uh, I feel very, when people write me and tell me about their situations in their university or in their company, I feel really difficult. It feels a real challenge to me to weigh my words carefully because I, I, I'm not the one who's going to lose his career or who will have to figure out how I'm going to feed my kids if I don't have my job. But at the same time, I want them to also be willing uh, to honor their willingness to, sacri- to make this sacrifice if it's necessary, but without knowing them individually and knowing what the alternatives are and knowing what kind of support they would have, uh, I can't just issue a blanket, you know, here's what you should do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, if, I think that this is a good reason why we need to start talking about it right now, not just with our pastors, but with our teachers and with, uh, with, with people within the community so we can be training ourselves as Ko- Father Kolokovich's uh, students did to think, what would we do if we were asked to make this sacrifice? Where is the line? Very good. Great. I think we'll, I think we'll end it right there. 
Rod. Okay. Um, oh, this, it, I feel like I could go for another hour. Or well, so, yeah, but we, we, have we, things we, I have we, to. We yeah, we could too. Maybe maybe we could have you on again sometime because I've still got a whole bunch of things I'd like to talk to you about. But uh, if you could uh, if you could just stay on the line for a couple minutes, we're going to sign off. Um, um, I'll just rec I'll recommend the book again to all our listeners and viewers. Live not by lies. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. Great book. <laughs> And uh, just want to say thanks again, Rod, for coming on and speaking to us. Uh, we had a great time, and we hope everyone enjoyed it out there. It was a great pleasure to be here. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just a journalist. I'm not a, an intellectual. I don't have all the answers, but I hope I'm, I've asked in this book the right questions and the sort of questions that will prompt others who are more creative than I am and, or who have resources that I don't have to collaborate on building the sort of network of resistance and mutual support that will get all of us through whatever difficult times are ahead. So thanks for being part of it. Great. Thank you, Rod. Thank you.